In Mark Fisher's book, Capitalist Realism, he begins by noting that it's easier to imagine the end of the world than it is to imagine the end of capitalism. I'd add to that and note that it's also easier to imagine oneself as a member of Stalin's inner circle or to daydream about leading a Maoist struggle session. Fisher's point is a truism. Of course it's easier to imagine the end of the world than it is to imagine the end of capitalism. The bourgeois ideology that capitalism generates and even more, the functional success of commodity fetishism naturalizes and neutralizes capital relations. As Marx said, under capitalism we enter a world wherein social relations between people become social relationships between things. Or to quote him directly, men are henceforth related to each other in their social process of production in a purely atomistic way. They become alienated because their own relations of production assume a material shape which is independent of their control and their conscious individual action. The effects of commodity fetishism, the outcome of our domination by our own system of production and exchange, is far-reaching. Even self-identified socialists have difficulty escaping the logic of capital in their imaginations. And in the 20th century, escaping through political revolution proved to be even more difficult. This, I think, explains why our previous video about the New Left and its relationship with Marxist-Leninism and Maoism was so misunderstood and why it was so poorly received. This video will be an attempt to clarify just exactly what I meant. It will be the first attempt. I doubt it will be the last. Hello Zero Books readers and viewers, it's me again, Douglas Lane, and in this video I'll be discussing an essay by Resnick and Wolf from 1994 entitled Between State and Private Capitalism. What was Soviet Socialism? And I'll take a few excerpts from the upcoming book, Removing the Stalin Stain, as well. Defenders of really existing socialism, a really existing socialism that no longer exists, tend to focus on the role that the capitalist world played and the collapse or toppling of the Soviet Union rather than considering what internal weaknesses or problems existed within that state. Michael Parenti, for instance, in his 1996 lecture, Reflection on the Overthrow of Communism, spends a majority of his time making a moral case for the Soviet Union. He compares the results achieved for working people in the Soviet Union to those achieved in the West. He speaks passionately and eloquently about the hypocrisy of the West, the hypocrisy of Westerners who condemn Stalin, but who refused to see what the Soviet Union accomplished. Some say that the upheavals in Eastern Europe don't constitute a defeat for socialism because socialism never existed in those countries. What you had there was state capitalism, or some such thing. Well, whether we want to call them socialists or not is a matter of definition. Suffice it to say that they constituted something different from what existed in the profit-driven capitalist world as the capitalists themselves were quick and persistent to recognize. A real socialism, it's argued, would be controlled by the workers themselves through direct participation instead of being run by Leninists, Stalinists, Castroites, or other ill-willed evil leaders and bureaucrats who betray revolutions, we hear. Well, unfortunately, this pure socialism view is profoundly ahistorical and non-falsifiable. By that I mean it remains untestable against the actualities of history. Writing in The Guardian in 1991, Tony Febo questioned this pure socialist position. I want to read you what he said. Quote, It occurs to me that when people as smart, different, dedicated, and heroic as Lenin, Mao, Fidel Castro, Daniel Ortega, Ho Chi Minh, and Robert Mugabe, and the millions of heroic people who followed and fought alongside them, all end up more or less in the same place, then something bigger is at work than who made what decision at what meeting, or even what size houses they went home to after the meeting. These leaders weren't in a vacuum, they were in a whirlwind. 
and the suction, the force, the power that was twirling around them has spun and left this globe mangled for more than 900 years. And to blame this or that theory or this or that leader is a simple-minded substitute for the kind of analysis that Marxists should make. End of quote. The question of whether or not the economic foundation of the Soviet Union was socialist or should instead be called or thought of as state capitalist can't be settled by looking for good outcomes. After all, according to the U.S. Census Bureau, the entitlement programs of the United States lifted 47.7 million people out of poverty in 2018. And if we take a historical perspective, we can see that life expectancy in the United States has increased 67% over the last century. But neither the entitlement programs of 2018 nor the massive leaps in medicine and basic infrastructure should be characterized as socialist. Parenti quotes a journalist writing for The Guardian, a journalist named Tony Febo. Febo wrote, The leaders of socialist revolutions were in a whirlwind, and the suction, the force, the power that was twirling them around has spun and left this globe mangled for more than 900 years. To blame this theory or that leader is a simple-minded substitute for the kind of analysis Marxists should make. This sort of argument might be a good one if we were putting Lenin, Mao, Castro, Ortega, or Ho Chi Minh on trial. If we imagine Ho Chi Minh in court, or maybe just think of him using Twitter and facing a brigade of people set on canceling him, we might very well want to repeat this argument line by line in his defense. We might want to tweet it out. Although to do so, we'd have to break it into parts, as it exceeds the 280 character limit. If we want to understand, rather than condemn, if we want to go beyond 20th century socialism, then we perhaps should blame a theory or a set of theories, after all. Blaming a theory is a way to correct ourselves. It's a way to deepen our understanding, rather than a way to scapegoat an individual. If we take up the aim of developing socialism, of succeeding, where, by all accounts, the Soviet Union ultimately failed, blaming and or rethinking theory, reconceiving socialism, perhaps through a return to orthodoxy or perhaps through a correction to Marx, seems to be necessary. In fact, it's a necessity even on the level of rhetoric or on the level of practical politics because when we refuse to re-examine the history and theory of Marxism, when we argue, as Parenti did in 1996, that we should embrace both the good results of the Soviet experiment and the conception of socialism that emerged from it, then we grant too much to our enemies. And when the Marxists say, well, that wasn't real Marxism, what it really means, and I've thought about this for a long time, it's the most arrogant possible statement anyone could ever make. It means, if I would have been in Stalin's position, I would have ushered in the damn utopia instead, instead of the genocidal massacres, because I understand the doctrine of Marxism and everything about me is good. It's like, well, think again, sunshine. You don't understand it. You don't understand it. A real socialism, it's argued, would be controlled by the workers themselves through direct participation instead of being run by Leninists, Stalinists, Castroites, or other ill-willed evil leaders and bureaucrats who betray revolutions, we hear. Well, unfortunately, this pure socialism view is profoundly ahistorical and non-falsifiable. By that I mean it remains untestable against the actualities of history. It, comp it compares an ideal against an imperfect reality, and sure enough, reality comes off a poor second. The pure socialist ideological anticipations remain untainted by existing practice. They don't explain how a complex revolutionary society could be built and secured, how priorities could be set, how, how survival could be achieved by just having the workers own and control everything. How do you get expropriate enough surplus value to build an army to defend yourself against the invasion that comes? Realizing that Parenti and Peterson agree that what occurred in the Soviet Union is an adequate example of socialism, and that we no longer need to wonder about what Marx actually wrote, nor compare the results of the Soviet Union 
to the ideas in the books and pamphlets written in the 19th century by socialists, we should re-examine the question of just what socialism is, even as we hold on to Parenti's commitment to fight for the poor, the disenfranchised, and the exploited. In his book, Removing the Stalin Stain, William Briggs notes a key division in Marxist thought, one that arose in the early 20th century as the SPD debated the question of reform or revolution. Could socialism be achieved through cooperation with the bourgeois state and through the management of capitalist development? Or was there a need for a revolutionary break? According to Briggs, the question was not a moral one, but hinged upon an assessment of the character of capitalist relations and a consequent prediction about the future of certain reformist political movements. He wrote, Central to these debates were questions of revolution or reform, of whether capitalism was to be understood by breakdown theory or whether it was a self-regulating system. Those who favor revolution believe that capitalism reproduces and renews itself through cyclical crises that lead, over time, to a structural crisis. This, in turn, creates an unregulated system which must be resolved, and a new regulated capitalist mode is constructed. Those who advocated for a reformist road thought that capitalism could evolve into socialism in a process wherein one reform was laid upon another, and, just as importantly, in a process where the development of productive forces could produce the material conditions necessary for a new form of life to emerge. Despite the general tendency for capitalism to go into crisis, it was felt that, with proper progressive and scientific management, the internal problems of capitalism could be overcome, and that, in fact, the capitalist system itself was stabilizing. The expansion of credit, the cheapening of foodstuff, the increasing dominance of world monopolies, all of these, and more, indicated that the capitalist form could be relied upon to develop the material basis of society and to set up the conditions needed for the evolution of capitalism and to socialism. The purpose of connecting the reform or revolution debate to the question of whether the Soviet Union should be thought of as a state capitalist or socialist form of society is not to determine the revolutionary ambition of the Soviet Union or its leaders. After all, the USSR was formed through revolution. When we turn back to theoretically analyze what happened from our vantage point in 2020, we're not putting history and its actors on trial, but are instead working on understanding what sort of ambitions and aims we should entertain in the present. For example, in Resnick and Wolf's 1994 essay, Between State and Private Capitalism, What Was Soviet Socialism? The authors note that after the revolution, Lenin did not implement policies in a vacuum or according to his desires or whims but instead responded to external factors and needs. Under wartime conditions in 1918, the Soviet Union met its needs by requisitioning food and raw materials from peasant farmers, and not primarily through production of foodstuff as commodities for the market. Then, when this approach produced a conflict between the needs of subsistence farmers and the needs of the newly developing industrial sector, Lenin shifted from a war communism to a new economic policy, that allowed for the development of private capital and markets. Neither approach was what Lenin preferred, as neither were, in Lenin's own estimation, socialist. When we evaluate whether or not the Soviet Union was state capitalist, we should understand that for many of the Bolshevik revolutionaries, the difference between state capitalism and socialism amounted to very little, if anything. As Resnick and Wolf point out, the Bolsheviks didn't conceive of socialism or class society as primarily involving the production of a surplus value by a laboring class, but rather as a matter of property rights. They wrote, the issues framed as class issues were ownership, income inequality, and political democracy. And the socialist class structure of the Soviet Union came to be defined and defended on the basis of collective ownership income equality, and popular democracy exercised through the Communist Party. On the issue of surplus labor, there was silence. This explains why most criticisms of the Soviet Union hinge around questions of the undemocratic nature of the one-party state 
and the inequality that emerged between party bureaucrats and regular workers. It also explains why defenders of the Soviet Union, highly reputable people like Michael Parenti, point to the way the Soviet Union lifted so many out of poverty, and even point to the power of the Soviet state to direct production towards good social outcomes as evidence of the practical achievement of at least some sort of socialism, even if not all of the aims were achieved. What is left out of most debates about the Soviet Union is the distinction between capitalism and an often ill-defined or obscured understanding of socialism as a new form of production based on a new kind of social relation. What is ultimately left in place is an economic foundation wherein there are mature relations between people and social relations between things. Resnick and Wolf described the history of the Soviet Union as a history of an oscillation between state capitalism and private markets. We should note that, to a large degree, the development of capitalism in the West is likewise defined by the same oscillation. The West, with its move from a highly regulated Fordist society with a strong welfare state to a neoliberal order where more and more of what was in the hands of the state is privatized, mirrors the shift from efforts at collectivization and state control of production to reluctant liberalization and the reintroduction of private capitalism in the East. Capitalism, in both its state-centric and liberal free market forms, tends towards crisis. The dynamic of capitalism itself leads to concentration followed by diffusion. And as Resnick and Wolf concluded in their essay, this means that the role of the socialist is to show both how a transition to communism's might resolve the crises of both private and state capitalism better than oscillations between them, and how the problems and contradictions peculiar to a future communism would be socially preferable to those of capitalisms.